This is the first Metroid game. The primordial form of not just one of the most revered franchises in gaming history, but of an entire genre. It's the original. Well, sort of. Metroid for the Nintendo Entertainment System, released in August of 1987, was, technically, a port of Metroid for the Famicom Disk System, released one year prior in 1986. The cartridge version drops the extra sound channel, loses the save system, and introduces a few random bugs, emphasis on random, but it also loses the load times and adds a password system. But to be a little more personal, this isn't just the first Metroid game. It was the first Metroid game that I ever bought for myself. Why? Because you see, by the mid-2000s, the internet and all of gaming culture was inundated with unrestrained, unchallenged, untempered nostalgia for the NES era. And, despite missing the entirety of it due to a critical existence failure, I felt like it was my duty as a real gamer to own it, nay, to love it. So on a midsummer mall trip with my friends, I peeled off to GameStop and got this cartridge. Incidentally, I also bought this poster. Yeah, being a so-called real gamer was a big part of my identity as a teenager. I mean, obviously it still is now, but it was back then too. But this was gonna prove my cred. Oh, you casuals might think you're happy with your fancy halos and your GTAs, but stuff like that's just not gonna satisfy the tastes, the standards of true, hardcore gamers like me. Eh -eh. Cause guys like us, we know true greatness comes from gameplay. True art comes from limitations. At least that's what guys a decade older than me on the internet said. Anyway, I think I played it for like 20 minutes at the most. Honestly, I wasn't even particularly surprised by that. It had happened so many times. I would hear someone online describe an NES classic as one of the greatest games ever made. Then I'd get the game, and bereft of context, I would set the controller down a few minutes later, feeling like I was missing something. This was my first Metroid video. I made it more than a decade after that day at the mall. But as much as I had grown up in that time, I was still largely missing that very same something. Perspective. I still struggled to see something older than me in the context of its own time. And maybe nobody really can do that, but that first Metroid video was teeming with early installment weirdness. While I would sort of figure it out as I went along, at this point I didn't have a solid handle on what I wanted a video on a Metroid game to even be. Because of all that, I've increasingly come to think of this episode as a bit of a blemish on my Metroid series. I made criticisms out to be worse than they really were because I pushed up against the game's intentions. I critiqued it through the lens of the time I grew up in and gave very little grace to the time it was released. I refused to take the manual suggestion of drawing a map to heart, dismissing the notion out of hand as a waste of time and a sign of how outdated the game really was but I'm not who I used to be. Let's run this back again, the right way this time. No ROM hacks, no emulators, I'm gonna play it on this cartridge, the same one I bought at the mall all those years ago. I'm gonna be as authentic as I can be. Which, it turned out, required more boiling water than you'd think. If you know, you know. I wanna try to experience Metroid the way my mom would have when she was my age. I want to give myself that context. I want to see if I can appreciate Metroid the way those NES kids did, to try and see what they saw in it. I want to... Oh. I'm still trying to prove my cred, aren't I? Oh god. I don't know if anyone's ever noticed this, I am pretty subtle about it, but I'm real big on historical context. It is one thing to review a game, and of course that's valuable in and of itself, but a retrospective is different. I want to try to frame where Metroid fits in the tapestry of gaming history, but that is a lot harder to do when it's a history that predates me. So to give myself some context, I decided to start by playing some other games that were released in 1986. I started with Yu Suzuki's seminal arcade masterpiece, OutRun, likely the pinnacle of what was technically possible at the time. This is a title that strikes every note it hits with grace and perfection. 
this didn't seem fair to other games, so I switched over to the quote-unquote real Super Mario Bros. 2. And can I just say, man this game gets an undeservedly bad rep. In Japan at the time, you could literally go into a convenience store, put a rewritable disc into a kiosk, and load Super Mario 2 onto it for the equivalent of about $5. It was basically the 80s version of hard mode DLC for players who had mastered the original game. And there were a lot of Japanese players who had. Actually, Metroid also originally came out for the disc system. And it's just as much of an action game as it is an adventure. So wanting to focus in on that genre, I played what was an arguably Nintendo's most important release of 1986, The Legend of Zelda. This cartridge actually has a similar backstory to Metroid's. I got it because the internet made it sound like a masterpiece, but I played it and didn't initially understand why. The difference is I came around on Zelda way back in the Wii era, but it meant a lot to finally finish the game on this cartridge. I can't believe it still holds a save. It's probably older than I am. Finally, in the spirit of experiencing 1986 through my mom's eyes, I asked her what her favorite game that year was. King's Quest 3, To Air is Human. In the parlance of the 80s, this was considered to be the same genre as Zelda, an adventure game. But its mechanics, its systems, its game design philosophy is all totally different. East versus West, console versus PC. What they do share, though, is a seemingly intentional reliance on exceedingly esoteric progression. Where action games in the 80s demanded twitch reflexes, pattern recognition, and mechanical knowledge, adventure games seem to be designed for collaboration over a long period of time for a group of close colleagues helping each other toward a solution. The ideal way to play King's Quest was the way my mom did. After, and sometimes during work, on the IBM PCs you and your colleagues are supposed to be using for work. Just like the ideal way to experience Zelda is to play it with your friends for the entire length of one elementary school year. Between 1986 and 1989 in a world before the internet. Or at least before the web. It's easy to see why the adventure genre isn't what it used to be. Designing a game as an intricate, albeit esoteric, puzzle to be solved doesn't make a lot of sense when the player can be assumed to have all the information in the world at their fingertips. That ideal, for better or worse, is impossible to experience in the internet age. But this is the world that Metroid was meant for. So, as much as possible, I'm going to try to ensconce myself in an 80s bubble for this playthrough. All I get is the game and the manual. No online guides, no outside help, the only map I can use is the one that I give myself. Of course, I guess the experience is already kind of spoiled, it's not like I didn't beat Metroid back in 2016, but I don't retain much of it at this point. But you know, funny thing about learning. The more you work with information, the easier it is to recall. It would be easy to pull up a map and navigate through the game, but I very quickly noticed that the simple act of drawing those lines myself was a billion times more effective at helping me retain it. The other major difference I noticed early in my playthrough was also tied to that 80s authenticity. In 2016, I played Metroid on an emulator. Bright colors and crystal clear clarity rendered every pixel as flat as they could be. But on a CRT, those pixels are blended the way they were intended to be. The electron beam rendering the image isn't even firing for those pitch black backgrounds, whereas every other detail on screen is literally bursting with light. Through the display tech it was made for, a game with art as simple as Metroid's gains a shape and a texture that was frankly obliterated when you could just see it for what it was. It's far from the best looking game of its time, it is still very simple. But in an era where most games were colorful and cartoony by necessity, this is absolutely one of the most distinct. The world art is dense and varied across locations. Enemies all have unique animations and clear designs. I love how Screes, for instance, will vary their rotation, doing a little wind-up before they dive-bomb you. And then there's the Chozo statues. These things are drawn so much more intricately than everything else that they feel appropriately alien like someone or something with a higher brain pattern left them here. But there is one major issue I have with the visuals. 
And unfortunately, you've been looking at it the whole time. The game looks so distinct for the era it was released in, and then there's Samus. With her odd proportions, giant head, and janky running animation, she's neither detailed enough nor stylized enough to look convincingly human. It's like she's a little of both, but not enough of either. To put a finer point on it, the player character is probably the worst looking, worst animating thing in the game. Which, given she's the only thing guaranteed to be on screen anytime the game is happening, isn't exactly ideal. Given the NES's limitations, maybe part of it was necessary to get unique sprites for firing and not firing in different directions. But it is still quite a mark in an otherwise very visually coherent game. So the first thing you do in Metroid is go left and get the Morph Ball. Before I ever played it, I somehow knew that, like it was passed down to me by cultural osmosis. It wasn't something I ever thought about. So let's think about it. In a world where Mario had so recently standardized the idea that if you're playing a side-scrolling action game, the goal is always to the right, to the point that you couldn't even go left if you wanted to, Metroid needed to dedicate itself to teach the player differently. So if you do try to just play it like it's Mario and head right, you'll get blocked after a few rooms and need to backtrack. And I know this seems like the most basic thing in the world now, but it's the first lesson this genre ever teaches. Progression is non-linear. Search out upgrades that let you perform new actions, which will let you keep finding things. But what I noticed when I Mind Palace myself as an 80s kid was that if that lesson didn't take, if I got the Morph Ball then just kept proceeding right whenever I saw a door, I would quickly find myself heading to Norfair way before I was supposed to be there. The music swaps from the adventurous Brinstar theme to something a lot more threatening. The enemies are suddenly so much more aggressive, and it doesn't take long before... Like Zelda, Metroid will technically let you go places before you really should. Instead of blocking you off, it just kicks your ass. Later games would tend to make these soft blocks a lot harder. But here the game doesn't push back so obviously. It gives you the freedom to fail. This makes the world feel harsh and hostile, as Samus, and therefore the player, is currently unable to overcome it. And I'm pretty sure this was the point where my initial playthrough in 2004, and probably a lot of other people's before and since, came to an end. The game is so open it's very easy to stumble into something you're not ready for. How was I supposed to know that I needed to explore Brinstar to boost Samus's power? Oh yeah, that's how. In the mid-80s, games were rapidly becoming deeper and more complex, but the hardware they were built for was so precision-engineered for gameplay that most relevant information would, by necessity, be relegated to instruction manuals. This was really the beginning of a golden era for pack-ins, especially for adventure games. They weren't just a bonus, they were a necessity, and developers used them to enrich their worlds, making games with the expectation that players would want to see this. But by the time I was around, the first NES games I remember seeing for sale didn't look like this. They looked like this. And they still do, for the most part, look like this. I think this is one reason early gaming history has sometimes seemed to age worse than it really has. Even when publishers make manuals available for old games, they tend to do it via QR codes. Does anybody actually use these? It's been decades now since devs expected players to read instruction manuals, and a lot of people just don't. And honestly, even then, I'm sure a lot of people just didn't. Reading is unfortunately a chore to a lot of people. But it never was to me. So I hung around Brinstar, crisscrossed the map a few times as I charted it, and got powered up. A fun moment of recollection was when I came across the first E-Tank, and remembered what a godsend it was to happen upon it back in 2016. Speaking of, I also made sure to note the location of a few useful enemy spawners near the start point. Another similarity between Zelda and Metroid is this. When the game starts, you can't take too many hits. You can find power-ups to increase your health. If you die, your max health remains the same, but you always start back at that base level. In both cases, I think the intent was to incentivize the player to... well, to not die for one thing, but also to participate. Contrary to most games of this era, there is no live system. You have infinite chances. But that doesn't mean there aren't penalties for losing. And those penalties function within each game's design goals. Either fight enemies and get random drops, or explore to find areas where you can get an easier fill-up, 
And then, this is important, remember where they are. This is, of course, an egregiously antiquated philosophy, and if you've seen my 2016 episode, you'll know that I know firsthand how frustrating it can be. Games don't often punish you for failure in any significant way anymore, let alone making you restart from a weaker position. Still, this is one of the things I regret most about my original video. I died, restarted, and then, rather than just finding a spawner or building up my energy as I went, I chose to tediously run back and forth through a single room and timed how long it took me to build back to max health. I refused to engage with Metroid systems as intended, made a show of playing it wrong on purpose, and then acted like that was the game's fault. This is what I'm expected to do every single time I die. Forget about not having a map, forget about a lack of conveyance, the fact that you have to do this to even have a chance to get lost in this world is the biggest problem I have with Metroid. Believe it or not, I didn't do it with ill intent, I just learned the wrong lesson. Encountering something I was so unprepared for made me trepidatious of exploring without max health, meaning I was too scared to push forward without it. I didn't need to be. Brinstar is very easy and breezy. All that being said, it would have been nice if Metroid had something comparable to the Great Fairy Fountains, an area specifically dedicated to getting a recharge. As it is, E-Tanks serve a somewhat similar function. They don't just give you an extra set of energy, they completely top you off, but they're single use. There's a tank hidden right near the starting point that requires quite a few upgrades to get, and it would be a godsend if it would top you off every time. But I hesitated to pick it up because I knew I would only be able to use it once. I suppose in a macro sense, the replay value in Metroid comes down to playing it more efficiently. It was, after all, one of the first games to ever offer multiple endings based on how fast you beat it. Getting good enough and knowledgeable enough to avoid the time sink enemy spawners, and knowing when to take an E-Tank, that all might just be intended as part of that process. Still, Zelda did this with a little more finesse. During the power-up process, I also bombed down here and got the Ice Beam. Enemies in Metroid 1 are particularly spongy, but they have hit stun and pause when they're hurt anyway. And shooting a frozen enemy doesn't actually hurt it, it just unfreezes it. So the Ice Beam lets you use enemies as platforms, but it also makes killing everything take twice as many shots as it needs to. So I decided, you know, maybe I'm better off without it for now. I reset the game and did the whole Brinstar collection process again, skipping the Ice Beam this time. I would come to regret that. So, with the Morph Ball, bombs, two E-Tanks, two missile upgrades, and no Ice Beam in tow, well, now I've got a choice to make. I found two elevators. One goes to Norfair, which I know is intimidating from experience. The other one is actively trying to intimidate me with Kraid's big ugly visage. The goal of the game is to seek and destroy two bosses, Ridley and Kraid, which builds a bridge in the bridge room, which allows you to get to the final area. There's no wrong answer from this point. I could bomb through these blocks and try to find Kraid, I could go explore Norfair power up there and then come back for Kraid, or I could even try to make a beeline for Ridley. Most Metroid games are pretty open-ended, but they have a clear intended path for the first-time player. For Metroid 1, though, the game is so open that there's really no such thing as a sequence break. You're fully expected to chart your own path through it, and then come back and refine that path until you can get the best ending. But for this playthrough, I don't know if you've clocked this, but I'm in no hurry. So I decided to doodle on over to Norfair first, and find out if, with all these upgrades, maybe I'd have a better time. I did not have a better time. So you know how the manual makes a cute little tee-hee suggestion that you might, if you're so inclined, if you wanted to, maybe you could make your own map? Wouldn't that be fun? No. Norfair is the point where it became clear to me that they were being too nice. They needed to just replace that whole paragraph with a 72-point font screaming, you, you need, need to make, to make a, map. a map. And heck, Zelda came with a map. There was precedent for this. Metroid could have had a fold-out map in the box, with Brinstar partly filled in, and room for the player to draw everything else. Because yeah, buddy, you need a map. And I don't think I really understood why or how much until I actually had one. So many rooms in this game are copies of each other. Sometimes they're slightly different, and sometimes they're not different at all. 
A suspicious alcove might suggest a secret, but then you check it and find nothing. And then later, you'll come through what seems and looks and feels like the exact same place, but this time, there is something there. The effect had me darting my eyes from the screen to the map even as it was, trying to keep track of where I was. If I was just trying to make it without one, and I have, it would be absolutely confounding, and it is! You really can't just rely on your own sense of direction in Metroid. And I don't think this degree of that problem was really intended. Most NES games released after 1986 would include special chips inside the cartridges that would beef up the console's capabilities. But as a disk system game, Metroid could only take advantage of that add-on's capabilities. The NES hardware as designed was built with one goal in mind. To play a mean game of Donkey Kong, as Jeremy Parrish puts it. So a game as complex as Metroid was punching well above its weight. In a 2017 interview with Game Informer, Metroid frontman Yoshio Sakamoto said he was essentially strong-armed onto the team so he could save the project late in development. I realized that the release date was right around the corner, but the project had nothing there. Even with our limited resources and time, I figured out how we could leverage the existing components of the game to create variation and an exciting experience. Essentially, it sounds like part of the reason the map design becomes so much more esoteric once you get out of Brinstar is because they were crunching up against limitations, both technical and chronological. Metroid reuses and remixes map design for the same reason Mario did. For the same reason Zelda did. Because it was a necessity given the limitations of the hardware. Sakamoto's team just doesn't seem to have had the time to pull it off with the finesse of Miyamoto's. Looking at Metroid through the lens of its contemporaries, this probably is my biggest critique of it. I don't mind drawing a map anymore, but doing it has laid bare how little variation there actually is with these layouts. Which means even if you do keep track of where you are, Moment-to-moment -moment traversal within the same region is incredibly samey. It's less a remix of assets, and more a repetition. I mean, you could know this game like the back of your hand, and you couldn't tell me for sure where I am right now. And just to measure this point, I'm not criticizing the layout of these rooms, only their repetition. The way upgrades are placed is actually... well, here's an example. I hit the ground in Norfair and, like I said, immediately had a bad time. The beefed up enemies were still overwhelming me, and every road I scratched and clawed my way down seemed like a dead end. I just kept saying, I should've got the ice beam. I should've got the ice beam. I SHOULD'VE GOT THE ICE BEAM! I was about to begrudgingly head back to Brinstar and, you know, get the ice beam, when I discovered something. Well, I'll be honest, discovered isn't really the right word. More accurately, I remembered something. A piece of forbidden knowledge that I shouldn't temporally be able to know in my simulated 1986. An image from the future flashed in my brain of a remake of Metroid 1 from the next millennium, and I realized, hey, aren't the high jump boots down there? <gasps> they are. And now that I've got them, isn't the ice beam supposed to be up that away? Unfortunately, I was blocked off from getting where I thought it was by the very fact that I didn't have it, but there's a little more tunnel up there. I was able to circumnavigate the top of the map and come out behind the Chozo statue. Finally, finally getting the ice beam that I was so sure I didn't want. There are actually two of them. If you missed the one in Brinstar, you can still find this one in Norfair. Even if its room layouts can be repetitive and a bit labyrinthian, Metroid's map design shows an impressive amount of forethought, accounting for and enhancing the game's open structure. And I found so many missile upgrades while I was scrounging around Norfair that the slowness of the ice beam doesn't seem like nearly as much of a liability now. There is a phenomenon that I've experienced so many times, and you probably have to. You get in on the ground floor of a brand new series, and you fall absolutely head over heels for it. And then a few years later, the sequel is even better, building onto that strong foundation and adding new features that you didn't even know you wanted. So you stick with the franchise over the next decade or so, you're an OG fan getting to see it grow and evolve, and then one day, you come across a much newer fan who thinks that original game that started it all, that means so much to you, that game sucks. Or maybe you've been on the other side. You fall in love with the series and delve into its back catalog, only to find the earlier games much harder to get into. I've been on either side of this so many times and with so many games. When you get into the first entry in a new series, you can't miss what's not there. You can only appreciate what's added later. But if you discover a franchise on its, like, fourth or fifth entry, it's often the exact opposite. You go back to the earlier games and you can't help but feel like something's missing. 
Modern day Samus can aim in 360 degrees, parry incoming attacks, freely swap her loadout, and can be kitted out with such a ridiculous range of upgrades and abilities that they'd make 80s kids' heads explode. But in Metroid 1, Samus can fire straight forward, but get ready. She can also fire straight up. Future titles would refine and expand even this basic moveset to the point that even if you've played just one game ahead of this one, going back to it is gonna feel limiting. And of course I can't totally remove myself from all that, but let's try to consider Metroid's core design on its own merits. The interface is clean. Unlike a lot of NES games, there's not a big status bar cluttering up the space, and Samus herself is very small on the screen making it clear that the real star is the world around her. Samus's jump arc is long, slow, and floaty, and while her movement can be a little slippery, it's easy enough to get a handle on it. Broadly speaking, game design is always trending easier, and one of the ways gaming got easier in the 16-bit era was to give the player's base abilities more capability. Your whip, your sword, your gun, your arm cannon can overcome things that they couldn't in the 8-bit days. And by the way, as a kid who started gaming in the mid-90s, this was one of my biggest barriers to getting into NES games. I started with a Mega Man who could do this, and this, and this... So it was hard not to feel like a whole lot was missing when all the old Mega Man could do was this. But what was often muddled, if not lost, in the transition was how those limitations could encourage the player to engage with the game's other mechanics. The first time I played Metroid, I wondered why in the world there were enemies too short for me to hit, and in the very first room. Why can't I jump and shoot straight down? Or aim diagonally? But it's for a lot of good reasons. In this room, I'll learn that some enemies can crawl on walls and ceilings. I learned that I can use the terrain to my advantage, and it won't be long before. How many times in any other Metroid game do you use bombs on offense when an enemy doesn't expressly demand it? How often do you duck out of enemy attacks with the Morph Ball? How often does getting the Wave Beam actually matter? I'm not saying future games are inferior to this one by any means, just that this original slate of power-ups was tied to what Samus could do here. Seeing how they stack up in that context makes me appreciate him more than I ever did before. Especially this one! The screw attack is almost always one of the endgame upgrades, and with good reason. But the original Metroid is so open, the idea of an endgame is more of a suggestion. And I found it early. It always feels like a cheat. Like you're breaking the game in the best way, and never more so than here. It's no wonder it went on to become as literally iconic as it is. With the screw attack in tow, I decided I'd gotten all I could out of Norfair for now, so I headed back up to Brinstar to grab a few more things, most notably the Varia suit. Early on, Metroid's design is so tense and hostile, but as you build Samus's power, you start to tip the scales in the other direction. That contrast between where you started and where you can get, the difference between the first time I came into this room and how it felt to do it this time. That kind of thing has always been one of my favorite things about Metroid. Now I was feeling confident and sure-footed. I knew this world. I was charting this world. And I could overcome this world. With that, I set my sights on Kraid. Before any of this, before I started covering Metroid for this channel, before I ever bought Super on the Virtual Console, before Metroid Prime was even released, before I knew, let alone loved, almost anything else about this series, I knew and loved this song. And you know why? Hail to the Kingmaker, baby. While there's a lot about this game that benefits from my self-imposed 80s nostalgia filter, the sound design is as strong as it ever was. Hirokazu Hip Tanaka is a living legend of video game composition, but in Metroid's case, he actually wanted to push back on the trend of game music that sounded like game music. He tried to write music that matched the world within the game, rather than scoring the action of playing it. Metroid is notably far moodier than its contemporaries, as Tanaka strived to make the sound design itself, as he described it, a living creature with no wall between music and sound effect. The pitter-patter of Samus's footsteps, the shrieks of the Zebezian wildlife, the whoosh of the missile launcher, it's all so distinct, 
even more so if you're playing the Famicom Disk System version, which enables a richer texture for the sound design. Tanaka had enough pull that he even insisted that some of the game's graphics be altered to fit his perspective, blending aesthetic into atmosphere. The more I learn and the more I play, the more I realize Zebus itself really is the main character of the original Metroid. Where Norfair pumps up the difficulty by throwing much stronger enemies at you, Kraid's lair makes them way more plentiful. Enemy spawners are no longer a means to restock, they're a hazard unto themselves. And they're placed right next to doors so often that even if you know to watch out for it, even if you're trying to be careful, you'll still get hit by things during screen transitions. Yeah, there's no way this wasn't intentional. At least I got the Varia. And if Norfair was bad about recycling rooms, Kraid is basically running his own recycling center. Look at this. I drew this one identical room seven times! Here's a tip. If you drop in and go through the first missile door you see, just stop right here. Continuing forward is a pointless waste of time, leading only to a pair of columns connected by three of those seven identical rooms. The lair seems built to confuse and confound the player, with tons of looping sections and dead ends. In fact, a cool little flourish happens here. The game gives every indication that you have found the way forward. A fake floor drops you down a long tunnel, then a well-hidden passage leads even deeper, and as you reach what seems to be the depths of the lair, you find Kraid. But guess what? It's a fake! I wonder how many players were fooled in the 80s. Fake Kraid is actually much harder to get to than the real one. From the first tunnel, just go through this door, drop down the room with the sadistic block tower, head to the left, and there you'll find Kraid. And that's all you really need to do here. There are no major upgrades, just a few E-tanks and missiles. And even those aren't too much of a detour if you know where to look. IF you know where to look. I was musing earlier, Metroid's replay value comes from how much more efficient you can be on a second, third, fourth time through. And as much time as I'm taking on this playthrough, standing still and letting the music play while I write, exploring every nook and cranny of Zebus, and putting it all on paper, I have to say, I'm kind of surprised at how much I'm looking forward to the next. The build-up to Kraid is nicely done. The fight against him is... nothing to write home about. He just scuttles back and forth launching projectiles. As someone who played Super first, I was always surprised that this much smaller, original version of Kraid also launched claws out of his stomach. I mean, that kind of makes sense when you've got all this room to work with, but it's quite a creative leap to do it like this. Hang on, roll that back. Did I just download missiles? Yep, defeating either sub-boss dumps a metric ton of missile upgrades into your inventory, which is great for you as a player, but seems like a bit of an odd concession. The dev team knew they wanted multiple endings depending on how fast you got through, but they might not have had time to balance completion time with collection time, so maybe they did this to guarantee the player would have at least enough missiles to finish. Speaking of, I decided I wanted a password before I moved on, so... It's funny. Once I complained about how long it took to get health, and now I'm noticing how long it takes to lose it. And you have to get a game over to see the password screen. Or at least I thought you did when I did this. Turns out you can also pause the game, then hit up and A on the second controller to trigger the password, which will then dump you off at the beginning of the current area. Actually, this same trick works in Zelda, and would have been nice to know there too. But like, I only have one controller plugged in right now, and you know... I don't want to risk jostling the extremely precarious NES front-loading mechanism and losing my place. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. You're not going to play on original hardware. You're going to be smart and play these games on something with save states. Or at least something without such an egregious design flaw. But no, the market crashed and video games were a fad. And so now apparently Americans will only accept game consoles that look like VCRs. Oh, finally! There's this lengthy section of Norfair only accessible behind the high jump boots. I visited this area long enough to get the screw attack earlier, but when I came back to see if there was anything else I missed, well, the answer was yes! A lot, actually. And yet it all feels kind of tertiary. Like it's a scratch pad where a bunch of extra ideas ended up. And to be fair, plenty about Metroid belays a scattershot approach. Very few upgrades in Metroid are really hidden with intent, the way a future Metroid fan might expect them to be. Most of them are just sort of laying in the middle of random rooms. But there's just something different about this place. It's messy, and I kind of love it, but only kind of. Here, I happened upon the first instance of something that would become a staple for the series. An obstacle, 
just for a room or two, that's designed to frustrate the player, to make them wonder what in the world the dev team was thinking, and then the upgrade that solves the problem, making for a nicely cathartic moment of blasting through the tedium. Unfortunately, in this first attempt, the wave beam is so disjointed that it's not quite as cathartic as it could be. I keep missing things I'm standing right in front of, and it overwrote my ice beam, meaning I'm gonna have to go pick that up again before I can actually fight Metroids. And because the wave beam's projectiles are so slow, I'm really noticing how bad Metroid chugs when there are too many sprites on screen. But this is a problem that's actually much worse in the NES version. The Famicom Disk System adds 8 kilobytes of RAM for sprite and tile data. Which doesn't sound like much unless we remind ourselves that we're still pretending it's 1986. The disc version definitely still has slowed down, but it is noticeably snappier and more responsive moment to moment. But alright, enough messing around. It's time to take Ridley down! For the first of six billion times. Ridley's Lair is designed with more consideration, intent, and polish than anything since Brinstar. Upgrades are hidden behind secrets or skill challenges, instead of being placed somewhat haphazardly. In one case, an E-Tank is even used to bait the player. The map itself is teeming with variety, and layout reuse is kept to a minimum. Enemies, especially these Meta Knight-looking dudes, seem a lot more likely to drop large health and missile pickups. It's definitely not easy, but it's not frustrating. It's a fun challenge. Most of the time, Metroid feels like a struggle against the nature of Zebus. This place harbors no ill will toward you specifically, but you are encroaching on the natural order. Ridley's Lair is different. There are claustrophobic tunnels densely packed with aggressive enemies that target you directly. And yet this is no labyrinth. It's almost inevitable that a false floor or a mistimed jump will send Samus careening down deeper into the lair. It's almost as though Ridley wants to be found. Norfair and Kray do have plenty of unique attributes themselves, but what they lacked was this level of polish, of consideration. If the whole game was as well measured as this, I think it'd be easier for post-80s kids to get into it. Even when you hold it against other games of 1986, this first Metroid is a deeply flawed gem. But in between the cracks that scar its surface is a wellspring of depth and potential just waiting to be realized. And nowhere is that potential more obvious, or more realized, than here in Ridley's lair. The very first blowout between Samus and her most iconic rival. How strange is it? How hard would it have been to imagine back then that a sub-boss of the first game would become the series' most recurring villain? That players across the decades would be struggling against this monstrosity for generations to come? Is anyone else starting to feel like we overtrained for this? You remember that trick I mentioned earlier, where you pause and hit up and A at the same time on the second controller? I've actually got two controllers plugged in now, so I can make use of it. Instead of climbing all the way back up to Brinstar, I can reset to the start of Ridley, go up, reset again to the start of Norfair, go up, and reset one more time to wind up all the way back at the beginning of the game. It's rudimentary one-way fast travel, at the cost of all your energy. At this point I notice something kind of funny. The game has more E-Tanks than you actually need. Samus' health maxes out with six, leaving the other two as optional single-use recharge stations. Well, now I know I shouldn't have taken that E-Tank at the start. And I'll remember that. That cinches it for me. Knowing where the E-Tanks are is as much a part of the long game as knowing when to take them. I've spent this playthrough drawing maps and writing scripts, there's no way I'm gonna get the good ending. But next time, next time. As I made my way to the top of Brinstar, across the bridge, and down to Torian, the mask of 1986 started to slip, and I couldn't help but consider Metroid's place in a wider context. To consider its place within the series, and how I came into it. When I considered buying Super Metroid on the Wii Virtual Console in 2007, I was worried that I wouldn't like it. Most of my favorite games were fairly straightforward, twitchy action games, and the idea of something with so much exploration and backtracking sounded on paper like it was going to be too far out of my range. I took a chance and hoped that it would click with me. And it did click with me. It clicked with me in a way that other games in this series had not, and in a way that most games in this genre still don't. In years down the road, the series as a whole would resonate with me to a degree that I still couldn't have anticipated. There's just something different about Metroid. I didn't know what it was in 2007, and I still didn't in 2016, and I still didn't really see it 
until now. To see Metroid stripped down to its raw, unpolished, unprocessed fundamentals, I finally see it. My first playthrough of a 2D Metroid game is always a good time, but in the long run it's almost... incidental. It's about reconnaissance, discovering where things are and testing the limits of what I can do with them. I've never gotten the good ending the first time through, and I don't think I'm really supposed to. But there is always another. And another. And another. I can be stronger. I can be faster. I can be better. I can sharpen my skill. The more I play, the more I know, the better I get, the faster I can be. And this right here is one of the first games that was ever designed with this intent. It doesn't just have unending. It incentivizes and rewards you for getting there faster. This is why Metroid games, and especially 2D Metroid games, are so sticky to me. They might not seem like it on the surface, but they actually do encapsulate so much of what I love about gaming. And you know what's gonna happen next time? I'm gonna blitz through Brinstar for upgrades. Kite a waiver up here to get the Varia suit early, ignore that labyrinth and beeline for Kraid, switch to Norfair and get the high jump, then drop into Ridley's lair, track him down and put him in his place one more time, warp back to the start and top up with that E-Tank, head to Torian, blast Mother Brain to smithereens, and earn my good ending. The ideal way to experience Metroid for the first time is unobtainable. I can never play it in 1986, but I can replay it as much as I want now. I can have this. And the funny thing is, a lot of the things I've criticized about the map layout and asset reuse are basically non-factors on a replay. If you were lucky enough to play it, beat it, and love it in the 80s, I'm sure that's the experience you remember. Because I remember so many of the games that I loved in the 90s the same way. Metroid the game is Metroid the series, and therefore Metroid the genre, in its purest, most primordial form. On its release in 1986, there was simply nothing else like it. Eight years later, it would fully realize its potential. And how lucky are we to live in a world where that's true? Plenty of NES-era concepts have fallen into obscurity, never refined, remembered only by those who were there at the time. But not this one. Metroid survived, thrived, flourished, and birthed a genre unto itself. But the original Metroid is one of those games where I suspect the majority of the people who get anywhere with it nowadays are YouTubers who want to talk about the whole franchise, kind of doing it out of obligation, as I was once. I definitely wouldn't recommend it to anyone who's only dabbled in the series, let alone somebody who's never played a Metroid game before. But if you're the kind of person who has taken the plunge, if you love this series like I do, and you want a first-hand appreciation for how it all started, break out the pen and paper, keep an open mind, and it just might surprise you. I'm glad I came back here and gave myself this experience. Over the next week, I'll be releasing Reduxes on the rest of the 2D series. None of them will be nearly as prolonged as this one, for better or worse. Then on December 25th, the season concludes with an hour and a half long critique of Metroid Dread. You can see that and all those videos early by backing me on my Patreon, but till then, you keep geeking, I'll keep critiquing. Thank you for watching.